So, um, a very warm welcome to Luca Garrettoni and Mauro Gentile. Yeah. We, are, we were already making some kind of jokes about <laughs> the last name and created a kind of uh, nickname because um, I think the meaning of the last name is like uh, being kind. <laughs> yeah. um, so it's Mauro Kind, the kind. <laughs> yeah, so it's Mauro Kind. Yeah, and um, they will um, give a talk about uh, vulnerability in the Flex SDK compiler. Um, that was, as far as I understood, already uh, known in the past and raised up again now. So, you're on stage. Please start. All right. uh, thanks. Uh, welcome, everyone. It looks like a private setting, so it's perfect. I mean, just ask questions, interrupt us if you, if you, know, if you have, want to know a bit more. Um, we're very happy to be here. Uh, we were looking for a conference uh, when we, you know, were close to, uh, you know, releasing the details, and then I, we, we saw the CSV for Trooper, so we're very happy that we managed. Uh, there was a lot of disclosure involved in, uh, in this research, so it was complicated to uh, put all pieces together, but really we're, we're happy to be here and that everything was, was properly uh, made. Um, so my name is Luca, I lead the security team, uh, assessment team at LinkedIn, um, uh, based in Mountain View, California. And uh, today here with me there is Mauro uh, Gentile, he is an application security consultant uh, with Mandate Security, uh, an Italian uh, consulting company focused on pen testing and security. Um, Despite uh, the names, you know, the first letter of the names, Luca, uh, so the L and the M, we are not Luigi and Mario. Um, what else? Um, um, of course, uh, usual disclaimer, um, uh, you know, our company do the endorse the search. Uh, this is our um, point of view, and you know how it goes. Um, so, quick agenda for today. Uh, so we're going to uh, cover a bit of introduction on same origin policy. If you are in web security, this is probably obvious to you, but uh, otherwise it's, you know, to make sure that we are all on the same page. And then uh, a bit of details around the vulnerability analysis, um, uh, the patch that the Adobe released and, you know, the reversing around that. And then uh, probably the most inter interesting part uh, where we perform an internet-wide scan uh, for, for this vulnerability. Um, as you will see, um, it, it, it was complicated. We, we discovered first the vulnerability, then later on uh, it was patched, reported by Adobe by someone else. Um, so we're going to see um, all, all the scurses. So how it started, I think it's, it, it's natural that every time someone presents at a security conference, there is always you know, a starting point. And for us, it was uh, something like that. I, you know, one of us, and I won't disclose who is who, uh, sent a message to the other saying, well, I've been sitting on a bar for a month. Uh, I want to do something about that, right? And the other one replied, well, I have no you know, private life. I have no life, so why not do, you know, we, we start using a debugger and, and, and play around. And so we started playing, and then, you know, one person, uh, you know, was testing and, not, and nothing was working because it was using, you know, some test cases that were already patched by Adobe. The other one was not, and so we're basically chatting all the time saying you're drunk, you're, it doesn't work, yes it works. And so it, it, was, it was very confusing, uh, you know, mind blowing. Um, it, it, there is something that I, I kind of want you uh, to go away today and, 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 and kind of a suggestion is um, whenever you're working on something and you get an idea, just note it down. Like take a note, you know, notepad or a text file on your file system, a Google Docs, whatever. Uh, I, I find you know very inspiring um, to basically note down uh, when I have an idea, and then obviously we are all busy. We don't have time to investigate it straight away, so you can get back. And we actually uh, you know started these things a, a few months, probably years ago, and then kind of left everything and then um, started again uh, recently. So um, that, that's that's our tip. Um, so quick introduction. Um, so. Adobe Flex, uh, which is now Apache Flex, so Adobe donated the entire code base to, to the Apache Foundation in 2011. It's an open source SDK for building a Swift file. So 
uh, you're probably familiar with you know, Swift file. You can basically build Swift file in two ways. You can use pure uh, action script. That's the uh, traditional way. At some point, Adobe realized that uh, they needed to build um, a kind of better framework, an easy to use framework, where you could basically specify uh, application through um, uh, XML-based uh, files, and then action script for the actual code. And so when you combine those things and you build using the Flex compiler, uh, you basically obtain a, a file that can be played by the same Adobe Flash player. Um, so not, a, not all uh, SWS files that you will find on the internet are, are Flex application. Um, but in most cases, when there are uh, actual applications, so not, not just video or you know, uh, animations, uh, most likely it's going to be a Flex file. Um, uh, yeah. So um, an interesting thing, which is basically where, where we started looking at, the, at, at these things, is that uh, at some point Adobe decided that it would be interesting to have um, dynamic localization, right? So if you have an application for different uh, languages, uh, you know, it, it would be convenient to have a mechanism to have, as you can see on the right, a placeholder for a particular string, for example, in this case for a label, and then have on the, on, on the left side um, you know, different property files that basically specify uh, um, a name value pair um, so that you can have basically different localization resources depending on the language. Um, and so to build localization into Flex application, there are basically two ways. One is compile everything in a monolithic file, so you will have a huge file with all resources, everything in it there, or um, for obvious reason, you know, to make sure that you, you, know, you can have uh, smaller files, um, you can extend the application without recompiling uh, everything from scratch, they decided to enable also um, dynamic localization. So uh, there is a specific component that is uh, basically, when, when you compile a Swift file, uh, the SDK, the compiler, uh, wrap around your file with um, some components. And one of those is a resource module, which is basically uh, the, you know, the, the, core, the core mechanism to load um, at runtime localization resources. Um, the way you use uh, the resource module is through flash bar. So if you're not familiar with uh, flash, uh, you basically, if you want to pass arguments to the flash file, use flash bars. Um, so uh, you basically add a parameter into, for example, an object, um, and then you pass the value. And so if you pass the value called resource module URLs, you will be basically able to pass um, a, a dynamic localization. So in this case, we're passing uh, you know, an English Swift file that represents the localization. And the resource modules are basically a common separated list of, of URLs or resources. And you probably know already where we are going here. Um, quick, quick slide on uh, same origin policy for Adobe. It's slightly different than uh, traditional same origin policy in browsers. So uh, easy example, obviously, if I, I'm, I have a, a Swift file on a specific domain, let's say hey.com, uh, obviously, a.com uh, Swift file can access everything on a.com. Um, there is a, the possibility to do cross-origin interaction. And the way you do that is basically on the second domain, you specify cross-domain XML file, basically allowing um, other fi uh, file to access resources on that domain. So a flash movie hosted on A can access uh, stuff on B.com. Uh, only if only uh, you, know, you specify uh, the, the origin domain in a cross-domain file. Um, and one interesting thing is that as soon um, you know uh, a flash file can can send a HTTP request, so it's allowed to send a HTTP request to a particular website. Um, you basically uh, get you know uh, the, the full the full uh, the full deal, right? You, you can send a HTTP request. The browser will at, uh, give you know attach the cookies. You will get back responses. So. Uh, you are basically, you know, um, in control of, of you know, an entri entire, you know, um, fetch and retrieve. Um, and if you, if you are in web security, you probably remember the fl uh, Rosetta Flash, uh, where basically the idea was to abuse a JSON uh, P endpoint to, um, to basically reflect a Swift file. In, the, in this case, it was an alphanumeric Swift file that would do um, basically uh, data hijacking. So it would, would send the request to the website and then retrieve the private data. 
um, you will see uh, we will be basically using the same uh, attack mechanism in this way, in a sense that uh, you know we will be sending requests and then retrieving responses that obviously contains uh, data from an authenticated user. Um, I guess uh, it, it's it's you know, it's very well known, obviously, that if you if you upload a flash files, uh, you know, on your domain um, and it's not separated at all from your primary domain, uh, and you know, those are user supplies we file. People can trigger cross scripting. Uh, you know, that's not a surprise. And so people have done uh, you know use different countermeasure uh, sandbox domains. You know, that's what, for example, Google does, uh, where user supply content goes to completely different domain. So uh, or forcing uh, uh, you know download through content disposition and other other techniques. Um, you obviously need to take care about uh, polyglots uh, and polyglots. I mean, file that are like a combination of multiple files. If you are familiar with GIFR uh, by Billy Rios, you know where you had a GIF, uh, like animated GIF and uh, whatever, and, and a jar file. Um, so there has been a lot of research on so polyglot file for Swift. Um, this is just like a. a yeah, generic overview. So uh, we know that a web page can uh, ask Flex uh, apps to load resource modules. Uh, the resource module can be a URL. So I mean, it's you know it's e easy uh, to imagine that uh, you know what if uh, I try to load a Swift file from a completely different domain. So that's what we did uh, back back then. I don't even remember you know how many months ago. Uh, and uh, or years ago probably, and it, it, it works. And so uh, you know, big surprise was like, wow, this seems like a very bad thing to happen. And then um, yeah, we did a, we did an investigate for uh, at that time. And at some point, um, when we started studying again this vulnerability, we discovered that Adobe patched it. So um, we basically uh, find out that Adobe released the patch uh, patch into November uh, 30th. Um, where it's basically describe a very similar things. In this case, it was marked as a cross, like universal cross scripting, basically. Uh, and we will go into details. Um, I know I, 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 when, when they discovered vulnerability at that stage, we didn't really understand what was going on. Um, and so uh, someone, you know, disclosed these things before before to Adobe. So um, props to whoever discovered, maybe even the Adobe security team. Um, but at, the, at that point, you know, we're very curious because imagine you're doing a security research. Unfortunately, you don't have time with other stuff. Uh, you know, you, you understand there is something wrong, but you don't know exactly what's going on. And then at some point, you see a security advisor. So the first things you do is, you know, get into the details and trying to understand what's going on. Um, so we started against, uh, you know, uh, revitalize the research. And so, um, you know, the example is you take uh, as a resource module URL, you specify uh, an external Swift file. And the idea is you, you ask the victim, you, you let the victim load an HTML page that loads the resource module as a flash bar. Um, and then, as we will see, this is basically uh, uh, leads to a, a basically same origin policy bypass. Um, so there are different exploitation scenarios that we analyzed. Um, um, the most interesting one, uh, uh, considering the current browser implementation and Flash Player, uh, again, this is the this is the bug in the SDK. So uh, you know, Mar will cover this aspect, but this is a very interesting aspect. Um, so it, it, with the latest browser and latest Flash plugin, the most interesting vulnerability, uh, well, at attack is the same origin request forgery, where you basically can send an HTTP request and read entirely the content. Uh, another thing that we investigated was about UI uh, redressing. So. What if, you, with a resource module, you control strings, right? What if uh, you can create phishing traps or somehow create you know, misleading warning by basically just changing text, spacing, and other things, right? Uh, and so that, that is also something that we, we, we played around a bit. And then um, the, same, the, same, the same vulnerability in older version of Flash Player was basically a universal cross scripting um, because it was possible to pass the parameter from the, uh, from the URL. Um, so uh, one step back. So if you if you load a flash file directly from the URL of the browser, the browser will basically automatically create an HTML page. It's a boilerplate, right, where it's basically loading an object as we file. And so um, if everything is contained as, a, in a, as you know as a square string parameter, you're basically gonna get 
uh, everything uh, belonging to that specific domain, which again, uh, that's the reason why it leads to uh, cross scripting. Um, in current version of, of uh, uh, Flex, you cannot uh, load a resource module from the query string. And so that's, that's what breaks the universal cross scripting and transform these things into uh, more uh, same origin uh, you know, requests for jerry kind of things. Uh, we actually don't know if it's a security announcement or a bug. Uh, again, uh, when we started investigating, we, we realized that on, on, on recent version that was the deal. Uh, we found on the help uh, center for, for Adobe, uh, some people complaining about, you know, they build stuff and it was not working. And the official reply was that the child's we file um, there are loader at runtime sometimes fail and it's a known bug and it's not going to be fixed. Um, uh, and so th the solution is basically uh, specify uh, resource module URLs within an object, so in, in, inside HTML. Um, which again, it limits in the impact of vulnerability. Uh, we have found a situation where applications are using custom wrappers and so you still get a universal cross scripting but that's something that a, a developer really need to uh, spend time uh, on it, so. Um, so at a very high level, how does attack on you know same origin request forgery works? Um, the idea is you you, uh, you, you know the, the victim uh, browse a website and then you basically force the user to load your arbitrary resource and then this resource uh, which inherits the uh, security domain of of the the, the target um, send an HTTP request with cookies and everything, gets the data and then potentially sends back the data to the attacker. Um, with a bit more details, uh, what we have is, uh, you know, you're browsing the web, watching cat, you know, video or, you know, unicorns, whatever you like, and then you go to, um, you know, the vulnerable site, you log in, and you're doing your stuff. At some point, you go to an attacker's site. Um, I mean, browsing the web, it's basically going through third-party sites, so um, no big deal here. Um, the attacker side will uh, send you back an HTML page, which basically contains an object tag that includes the original flash file that is hosted on the vulnerable side and the resource module, which is hosted on the attacker side. So uh, step three, include a vulnerable as we file, is because the flash file gets parsed and played by the browser, um, it, it starts loading, and then uh, because it's using resource module, it will fetch the, um, it will try to fetch the resource module from the attacker side. But first things is obviously checking the cross domain. Can the vulnerable side uh, flash file retrieve resources from the attacker side side? Um, um, and so we are, we are managing everything here, right? It's, it's asking for a cross domain on the attacker side. So, um, we are basically specifying, you know, a wildcard. Every domain is allowed cross domain, so no, no problem here. Um, uh, the flash file gets downloaded, it loads and executes. Based at this point, I mean, it's uh, you know arbitrary JavaScript gets executed inside the browser, uh, so we can fetch private data from the vulnerable side and then send the info to the attacker. Uh, be more details about the code. Uh, this is a proof of concept that we made, and that's the same proof of concept that we disclosed to all website. Um, so uh, on the top, you see the landing page. So this is the page that you would visit as a victim, right? Um, so uh, at the bottom, you see an object tag where you see, again, a parameter, a flash value parameter with a value a resource module that is hosted on evil.com, which is, you know, our fictitious domain for, for the attacker. And then, uh, if you notice, there is a, uh, another URL parameter call from, I mean, it's a nested thing, so it may be complicated, but it's basically another URL parameter, which is an argument of our malicious Swift file. And we're going to see in a minute why, why we need that. Um, uh, on, on the top of uh, the test HTML, you also have a text area uh, with a class ID X. Um, as you will see in a second, this is simply a uh, way for us to display the content of the page, again, as a proof of concept. You could replace that part with another JavaScript that sends uh, the information to a third party website or whatever you want to do. Um, at the bottom, you have a cross domain XML, obviously, uh, access for um, all sites. And so, this is the generic payload. So, we built a, a flash file, a flex file that was basically. Um, 
doing the actual logic of the, the attack, you know, what, what you want to do as, a, um, as, as an attacker. So um, uh, the, the, first, uh, the first string that we uh, um, highlight, it's basically getting the URL parameter from, from that is passed through the flash variable. And the idea is uh, we want to have an automatic way of saying fetch this specific URL from the victim domain, from the you know, target domain, uh, so that we could reuse these things multiple times. Um, and at the bottom, which is probably the most interesting part, is uh, after uh, you know, the, uh, this action script fetches the URL, again, with cooking and everything, gets back uh, the response, uh, we want to set the content that we retrieve from the target side to back to the text um, uh, area that we have. So what we are doing is simply replacing, uh, well, adding a value to the element uh, with ID X uh, in the DOM. Um, again, uh, at that point, you could potentially send to another third party. You know, you probably do something different if you really want to exploit these things. Um, so so we go, we're going to do the demo now. Maybe before, before we start with the demo, um, is the vulnerability clear at high level? Like, if there is any question now, I think it's it's better to we sort out everything so that after we can proceed with the demos and, and other things. So far, so good. All right. Okay. So yeah. So before proceeding, we uh, we want to show you a brief demo in which actually we are trying to let's say uh, exploit uh, CV 2011-2461 in a testing environment. <coughs> so actually, let us assume to have. Uh, uh, let's say a web application host on ideally on example.com, which basically allows users to log in. And uh, yeah, so uh, basically the application allows users to, let's say, view and reserve flights. Uh, uh, they can view flights, they can reserve flights. Uh, obviously, they can see their first name, their last name, their mobile number, and they can also change uh, their own password. So actually, as you can see, this is a Flex application, uh, and it is, uh, it is developed in a way that, as you can see, it is possible to change the uh, language. So it makes so uh, by loading uh, the resource module uh, at runtime. So the point here is that, is there any chance for an attacker to, let's say, steal some private information by exploiting the fact that this application, this flex application is vulnerable to CVE 2011-2461? And so let us assume that uh, I asked the victim to visit a proof of concept, proof of concept web page host on Havil.com. Then, uh, as you can see, basically, uh, Avid.com is able to steal some private information about the user, which is the first name, the, s the second name, its mobile number, and the anti cross request program, which is used for uh, changing uh, its password. So just to be clear, uh, actually this is the uh, HTML page which shows uh, how the POC works. So the first thing is that example, uh, the Avid.com makes uh, 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 embeds the uh, malicious, uh, let's say the vulnerable uh, Swift file, which is flight reservation. Then it asks it to load uh, an external resource module, which is hosted on Havil.com. And this latter makes a, a get request to uh, the home.php page, which contains some private information about the users, and this and is obviously hosted on example.com. And uh, as you can see in Firebug, so Actually, uh, the resource module is loaded on uh, avil.com. There's a request to the cross-domain.xml on avil.com, since the request is coming from example.com. And then uh, the malicious resource module makes a request to home.php, uh, in which it's, uh, and it's actually it's able to uh, extract some private information about the users the uh, users which are logged in. So just to prove that this proof of concepts really uh, really work, I can log out, I can refresh the page on Havil.com, and actually the malicious resource module is able to understand that victim is not logged in. Oh, so yeah. Oh. So at this point, uh, it's quite interesting to, um, to investigate, to understand how Adobe patched such issue here in 2011. And actually, uh, Adobe released a tech note in which uh, he released a tool, uh, he reported uh, how developers can understand whether the Swift files are vulnerable or not. And it also released a tool which basically allows to verify whether your Swift files are vulnerable. And it is also able to, let's say, uh, 
to uh, patch vulnerable Swift file, Swift files without needing to recompile the app. But the crucial point is that it is necessary to patch the applications to protect user data. And actually, this is quite unusual when dealing with flashbacks, since we uh, we used to see that Adobe usually fix, fixes uh, security bugs by pushing new releases uh, in the Adobe Flash Player itself. But in this case, uh, the patch does not affect the Adobe Flash Player, but instead the Flex Framework modules. And this is very interesting since this, this means that it is possible to exploit uh, uh, vulnerable Swift files uh, in fully patched web browsers and with the latest version of Adobe Flash Player. since. Uh, the vulnerability is patched in the <coughs> Flex uh, framework modules and not in the Adobe Flash Player. Uh, yeah, as I said, uh, actually Adobe provided a reliable tool for identi identifying uh, whether your Swift files are vulnerable or not. And we uh, investigated such tool in order to understand how uh, the, the whole patch process works. Uh, so, actually we, we are, uh, we were interested in uh, how, as I said, how Adobe patched such issue, and uh, we tried to test patched applications, I mean, vulnerable flex applications, which were patched by using the official Adobe patch tool, which Adobe released in its own tech note. And by testing such uh, flex applications, we understood that, we figured out that resource modules do not inherit this embedding Swift origin anymore in the case of patched uh, flex applications. And this means that it is not possible to exploit such issue uh, in the case of flex, uh, fe uh, patched flex applications. Uh, however, uh, although this may look very clear at this point, we needed to reverse the patch uh, in order to, un to make sure that we really understood what's, what was going on. Since during the first, the first test, we were seeing some, let's say, inconsistencies among different versions of the same flex application. I mean, uh, we were seeing that, for instance, uh, a Flex application was loading uh, Swift modules cross domain, whereas some others were not. And actually, this was the expected behavior, as the first one was uh, were vulnerable to CVE 2011 2461, whereas the second one were not. So, uh, in order to let's say we were in order to understand, let's say the. Uh, uh, which was the part in the flex framework which uh, uh, which led to the vulnerability we needed to adopt a specific methodology which which is shown in this slide so we took two two different versions let's say two versions of the same flex application sample the first one vulnerable to this issue the second one patched by the adobe patch tool then we decompiled the two uh, the two as we files and we diff them and once we got the diff, we were able to understand both the vulnerable action script code and the, and the patch. I mean, uh, it is obvious to understand that once we identify the patch, we were also able to identify the vulnerable code uh, as the patch uh, was applied to the action script, to the vulnerable action script code. Yeah. So in the end, we proved that our hypothesis regarding security sandbox inheritance was indeed correct. And uh, I will let you, yeah. So. Uh, as you can see, uh, this is, let's say, the part of the flex framework in which the vulnerability uh, was happening. So the vulnerability uh, took place uh, in the load method of the class module info. Uh, by, let's say, uh, decompiling a vulnerable ZWI file, we were able to view such source. And basically, the, the issue is quite easy since uh, uh, actually, the uh, the parent Swift file is loading the child Swift file by setting uh, its security dom security domain to its current domain, and this means that the child Swift file is inheriting the security domain of the parent Swift file. That's quite easy. Uh, as you can see in the case by in the case of a patched Swift file, I mean a, a Swift file which was patched by using the Adobe official patch tool. Uh, Actually, uh, we can see that Adobe patched this issue by introducing a kind of uh, always, false co always false condition, uh, which basically does not allow to enter the if branch. And, and this means that the security domain of the child Swift file is now set to the security domain dot current domain of the parent Swift file. And I mean, this is, the patch itself is, is robust, 
but uh, the goal is just to understand which is the point of the Flex framework in which the uh, action script code, the Vunabash action script code was. Uh, was. Uh, so, okay, from, uh, let's say, from, uh, say, it is important to note at this point that um, how, let's say, developers and site administrators can protect against such issue. And basically, there are three options. Uh, the first one is obviously to recompile vulnerables we file with the latest Ap Apache Flex, Flex SDK uh, by including static libraries. And as we know that the latest version of Apache Flex SDK uh, is not vulnerable to such issue. Another possibility is to patch the vulnerables we file by using the Adobe official patch tool. And this seems to be quite reliable, at least during our experience, during our tests. And well, the last, the last option is, uh, by, is actually to delete the vulnerables we files if they are not used anymore. Uh, well, the last suggestion is that you should not relax your cross-domain.xml file, but it's, it's uh, uh, a quite common security uh, uh, good practice. Oh, so, just to recap what we, we have said, Till now, so we had a, a very cool bug, but it turned out to be, let's say, a one-day bug. So, CVE 2011 2461 was patched in the Flex SDK, but uh, it can still be exploited in uh, fully patched web browsers with the latest version of Adobe Flash plugin. Uh, no technical details about the exploitation were ever published, and. So successful exploitation of such issue will lead to, let's say, same origin, uh, same origin request forgery, but also cross-domain, uh, cross-site content jacking. Uh, so data stealing and action fogging. Mm. Uh, so, uh, so at this point, the, the natural question is: Is there any chance to catch vulnerable real-world flex? applications after four years. I mean, uh, yeah, after four years since Adobe patched such issue here in 2011. So uh, in order to reply to this question, we need to, let's say, automate the whole vulnerability detection process. So first, we needed to identify vul uh, vulnerables we file by using a, pro a programmatic fashion. In order to do that, we needed to build a tool uh, whose name is Parotangi. Uh, and we needed to obviously scan the internet. About the third point, uh, we used uh, a modified version of Power NG, uh, which was which was using Selenium in order to automate a real-world browser uh, to download these WIF files, which are hosted on a target domain, to download them and to process them in order to verify whether they were uh, vulnerable or not to such issue. Obviously, we need to repeat such, uh, such operation multiple times with multiple computers uh, for any, let's say, uh, for any uh, target uh, domain. We so had to submit to troopers, so we had to speed up. The, at that point, it was like, okay, we do really need to speed up. So uh, the, about the, let's say, the first and the second points, uh, we obviously needed to, let's say, understand how to find a way to, let's say, discriminate among vulnerable we files and non vulnerable we files. In order to do that, we wanted to focus on the part which is vulnerable to, which makes uh, ZWI file vulnerable. And that is called, that is, as, as I reported before, that is the load method of the module info uh, class. So uh, what we did, we basically uh, analyzed the ABC, which is the action script bytecode, for uh, vulnerable and non vulnerable we files. This allowed us to, let's say, uh, to detect some patterns in the ABC, that is the disassembled hexer script code, uh, which, let's say, define the presence of the vulnerability. So once we got uh, the ABC part, the patterns in the ABC, we were able to build a tool which is able to, let's say, calculate the disassemble code and to, uh, to find some, to find this pattern in the ABC. So, so here we present Parrot NG, which is the tool, a custom tool we 
road, uh, to, which basically allows to uh, identify whether, uh, whether uh, a given ZUI file is vulnerable or not to CVE 2011-2461. It is written in Java. It is composed by just by a single jar, and it can be used as a command line utility, but also has a bar pro plus passive scanner plugin. It obviously uses a Swift dump in order to calculate the disassemble action script. It is open source. You can uh, already download it from the Lucas repo on GitHub. So one thing is that uh, if you, I, I wouldn't be surprised if you go download the plugin. Either you use a curl and your you know bash full scripting and download file and then use the command line or directly through burp. Uh, I, I actually wouldn't be surprised by the end of the conference you will actually find a vulnerable file. I mean, uh, we'll see. We did a wired internet scan, but then there are so many websites out there. So, um, yeah. So uh, at this point, uh, we want to show you how, as a brief demo about uh, about this tool, and uh, basically it is possible to use it as a common line utility. So in this case, I'm pointing to my local web server. And yeah, it basically can take as input as we file, or it can take as input a, uh, a directory containing multiple we files. In this case, it was able to understand that Fly Reservation 2, that is the Flex application used in the first demo, is vulnerable to such issue. Actually, uh, yeah, this, is, this tool is able to understand whether the Flex application was compiled with an old version of the SDK uh, and therefore is vulnerable, or whether it, is, it was patched by using the Adobe official patch tool, or whether it, is, it was compiled with, let's say, uh, a recent version of the Adobe Flex SDK or, or the Apache Flex SDK. Uh, obviously, the resource a module, in this case, this is the resus underscore uh, en underscore us is the legit resus module, and obviously it is not a flex application. Oh, yeah. So you can also use it as a purple passive scanner plugin. So in this case, I'm setting barpro as a local proxy. Oh, so. This is pop. Actually, in the extender tab, uh, a parrot ng has been loaded. Uh, so I disable the intercept. Then I can log in. This is the web application we used in the first demo. Uh, yeah. So I can switch to to the bar pro, and as you can see, barp immediately identified the issue, and. Uh, how does it work? Basically, oh, the bar pro passive scanner is uh, looks for uh, possibly looks for for uh, ZWI files in the browsing in your browsing history, and uh, if if it's able to find find some of this, uh, it uh, it pass, passes them to let's say the custom engine, which is actually Parrot Engine. And if the, vulnerable, the application is considered vulnerable, then uh, there will be uh, an alert in the scanner. Just for the sake of completeness, as you can see in the alert fi fields, files, uh, there's a kind of log about which are the ZWI files, which were analyzed by, uh, uh, by the, the, the extension. And what else? Oh, yeah. By looking at the startup out outputs of Barpro, you can also see what 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 was going on during the let's say the scanning process. Oh, so let me proceed with with the presentation. So, um, so between October and December two thousand four, we scanned uh, a few interesting domains for detecting vulnerable Wi files. So we scanned the top fifty Alexa. Uh, Adobe.com and many sites running a bug bounty program. And, well, uh, at the end of the day, we broke the internet with a four years old vulnerability that was maybe never uh, deeply investigated deeply, so never fully understood and never surfaced. So, as you can see, we identified uh, vulnerable flex applications on many high profile websites, as you can see in this slide, but 
uh, also many others which are not reported in this in this slide. So cool. Uh, so just to prove, just to make you uh, understand. So uh, uh, we just want to present a brief demo uh, about which we uh, we wrote a proof of concept against uh, Adobe.com. Uh, in which we were trying to steal single sign-on tokens uh, in order to, let's say, steal some private information about users which are logged in on Adobe.com. It is a video since it was patched by Adobe a few, a few days ago. Weeks, probably. Weeks, yeah. So, in this case, I'm logged in with my personal account on Adobe.com, as you can see, it does Mauro. Uh, yeah, so this is my account. So at this point, I, I'm assuming that the victim is asked to, uh, to visit a malicious web page that is ideally hosted, hosted on evil.com. Then it visits the proof of concept web page and as you can see, yeah. So as you can see, the, by exploiting Habuna Bot's we file host on Adobe.com, we were able to, let's say, steal some private information, about, some private information about the victim, which is logged in, in Adobe.com, and such as its email, its uh, first name, its uh, last name, and its mobile number. So the POC is quite interesting since. Uh, as you can see, it's in this case, basically, uh, the malicious resource module, which is host on heavy.com, makes a first request to uh, that domain, this, uh, this domain. And uh, this domain actually uh, serves some uh, single sign on web services. And let's say, uh, uh, by making a request to this domain, it is possible to steal. Uh, the single sign-on domain, uh, the single sign-on uh, the single sign -on token, and then the malicious resource module makes a sequence request, a sequence request to another single sign-on domain by passing the just stolen bearer token. This uh, this request, and as you can see, the response to this uh, to this second question to this second uh, uh, request actually contains the information which is reported in the text area where you can see uh, which is called victim, victim's data. So uh, uh, still, uh, it, is it is quite interesting to note that the whole process, the whole proof of concept works since, yeah. So the, the, the domains which are, uh, which are hosting the single sign-on web services are reporting such cross domain.xml file. <laughs> so they are defining a trust with respect to the adobe.com domain. And this mean that this means that uh ZWI files which are hosted on adobe.com can access also data which is hosted on these other domains. And this is the reason why the whole proof of concept works since the ZWI file the malicious resource module uh, is inheriting the domain the security sandbox of the adobe.com but can still make make requests to these other two single sign on domains obviously uh, the same is for the second uh, for the second single single sign on domain so yeah Okay. Okay. So, uh, as I said before, we reported this vulnerability to many high-profile security teams. Uh, we provided a specific proof, specific proof of concept. We also provided the first version of Parrot NG, and we also provided a PDF with uh, all with all the details of our research. An involved, involved party uh, was informed on a potential disclosure date. Once we uh, reached uh, a consensus, we identified an appropriate disclosure date. That is actually today. 
And uh, obviously, uh, there are many, there are still many more websites that are hosting vulnerable flex applications. So our suggestion is just to try to use our tool, uh, part ng to identify this, this vulnerable flex application, uh, to get in touch with the involved security teams, to report them, and to, well, just be ethical. And so basically, if you are a pen tester, I, I, I guess it's going to be, you know, three bucks for, for a few weeks and probably a month, depending on, you know, um, the reaction on many other websites. Again, we really try to do our best. Um, we notify probably 40 or more like sites. We also notified, um, C, you know, major CDN that they obviously have uh, visibility over a lot of traffic. Um, unfortunately, you need to patch every single file, right? Since uh, the patch is not in the, in the player, um, it really requires every basically website on the world to make sure that they are not hosting f flash files that are compiled with a vulnerable version. So. Um, if uh, I mean, uh, we, we really think it's the only way is is, is community-driven uh, approach where you know um, we all go around try to look for these things. Um, you know, hopefully other tools we integrate the same check so uh, that um, over time, uh, you know, all together we'll actually get to um, to notify everyone. Um, if you are hosting a vulnerable file, you basically have the same like a same origin policy bypass for your website. Uh, that works again on modern browsers, and it doesn't matter if uh, the Flash plugin is, uh, is updated. Um, if you get a bug bounty through these things, please send us a pizza or a postcard. Um, and uh, one thing that I would also note is that uh, I guess um, one of the suggestions we gave to Adobe is also to uh, work on um, a, a specific patch for the player again. Uh, it, it's going to be very. Um, it's going to take a while before you know all websites remove one of those we file. So uh, it would be beneficial, I think, to to get a patch directly in the in the fresh player. Basically, just checking which version of the the compiler was used and blocking if you know basically implementing the logic that we implemented in our tool. Um, okay. Yeah. Oh. Maybe just another su suggestion about well, we we said in the auto protect slide. Uh, those are actually the protection methods from let's say the developer's perspective. Perspective, but uh, from the user's pers perspective, maybe the best way to protect is to disable the Adobe Flash plugin. Well, yeah, as oh. usual, but just for the sake of completeness. So, yeah, that's. That's all. Yeah, that's all. So thanks for the attention. So look at my